Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of Building a Bridge. My name is Jesse Bizendine. I'm Jared Countess. <laughs> and uh, what we're doing here at Building a Bridge is, is we're our mission is to empower people to use their voice to build a bridge beyond race, beyond race relations, create unity and understanding, and effectively or hopefully raise the collective consciousness of humanity. We want to start off today by thanking everybody who watched the first video, listened along to the first episode of the first date, as we called it. And we appreciate so many of you who have been engaging in thoughtful discussions and conversations in the Facebook community we set up around this. And we invite all of you who might be new to this to join us over in the Facebook community, Building a Bridge 2020, because we're really hoping to migrate more and more conversation into there to push that mission further. In our previous episode, our first date, Jared and I spent some time talking about just commonalities, things that we share, you know, enjoyment of sports, who the figures were when we, we growing up, Bruce Lee, uh, Michael Jordan, and Jared's slightly displaced love of Larry Bird <laughs> over Michael Jordan, but we'll forgive him for that. And then we got into talking about the dynamics of, of Cousin Jimmy, Uncle Jimmy growing up and how he would he might do something uh, and commit some sort of criminal criminal act out of a act of love to help to help take care of the people in his life and we shared the almost the parallel of how my mom might have sacrificed much of her happiness and joy in life as an act of love to help elevate and give me opportunities in life and now we are here today. We encourage you, if you haven't watched that first episode, please do so. I think we'll, we all, we think you'll get much more value out of these if you watch them in succession. And we're going to do our best to keep today at 35 to 45 minutes. We appreciate the feedback. Keep it coming. So Jared is going to introduce what we're going to touch on today. Oh, today we're going to dig deep. We're going to, um, we're going to talk about the cousin Jimmy, uncle Jimmy, um, thing, but we're going to talk about black on black violence in terms of, we're going to rename it as criminal on criminal violence. Um, we'll go, we'll flip flop back and forth just for clarity's sake. But when we think of black on black violence, it is criminal on criminal violence. If it was just, you know, an abundance of black people who are law abiding citizens, killing other black people who are law-abiding citizens, then the numbers would be much, much larger. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how the median income for black families has gone up, how black people are striving to push themselves to higher and higher social and economic levels, how black women um, are the most educated group in the United States of America, right? Um, and then we're gonna kind of dig into the disparity, um, get a little ugly and talk about how black men are disproportionately sentenced to prison for longer terms. Um, and that's and, and, and what really systemic racism is. Um, <laughs> we're probably gonna try to rename that term uh, simply because because it's, it's, it's more injuring to the psyche. Um, and so it's not that these conversations are already difficult and it's not that um, I don't want to, I don't want to make them that much lighter, but I want to make the information easier to absorb. So we can use terms like implicit biases or subconscious thoughts and belief systems um, or that are based around a race and, and, and target. Um, and then we're gonna try to make some relations. But um, yeah, I guess I gotta flip it back to you. What's the, what's the first question? Like, what is the first part of that that um, you want me to talk about? Yeah, that's a hell of a buffet you laid out for us. <laughs> and so systemic racism would be, I think, in probably the place to start. And I'll say this as a, as a white guy, I don't understand it from the perspective of a black man. And it's a term that, to be perfectly honest, I wasn't really familiar with until just in the last several weeks. And now it seems to be everywhere. 
and I would, I think it would be helpful for me first. And, and I do also want to have full disclosure here with everyone. I love learning and I was sharing this with Jared beforehand. I want to try to approach these conversations with Jared as much of just who I am, where I am right now and allow some of my own education to be through these conversations. And then whatever comes up for it, for me to inspire my learning beyond knowing that we were going to talk about systemic racism today, I didn't feel it would do justice from my opinion, my perspective that I've lived in for my whole life to go and read in a bunch of academic literature on it. And then all of a sudden have a new opinion, my, my one week opinion that sounds more enlightened and more aware. And I want to talk with Jared, me as a white guy, Jared as a black guy and hear it from his perspective first and then share my thoughts and opinions on whatever he shares and then allow that to inspire my own learnings beyond. So now with that being said, I would love to hear from you, Jared, like just kind of what systemic, raci systemic racism is from your perspective. How do you define it? How do you see it? And we can evolve our conversation around that. Okay, so the first, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to broaden it, right? Um, before I shrink it down to African Americans and Black race, I'm going to broaden it to just the entirety of the United States, our system, right? So why was it hard for those people who are the children of immigrants prior to now, right? So like when the Irish first came here, right? Um, even during the Civil War and everything else, um, when Italians were migrating here at a large clip, um, coming out of, you know, or going into World War I, coming out of World War, going into World War II, um, why was it so hard for them to establish themselves, right? Um, and why were, for a time, Irish considered just one step above, you know, a nigga, for a lack of a better term, right? And so the truth of the, this is what systemic things are, right? So if you have a group of people who are quote unquote natives, if you ever ever seen gangs of New York, right? You have a group of people who are natives and um, in control of a power system, right? They are, they've been here already. So they've already established themselves an economic foothold. They've already established a political foothold they are entrenched in the judicial system, right? So they, they, all three branches of government, of governing bodies, they're already there, right? And then you bring in a new group of people and they have to live under the rule of this system set up by these people who were already here, right? They are not going to have as easier time getting up past that, right? There's going to be a lot of friction because people are going to help their friends, they're going to help their loved ones. And they'll take time before they say, they even get to know this new, we'll call it this new Jimmy, right? <laughs> <laughs> this Irish Jimmy. It'll take time before they even get to know him enough to say, oh, he's got good moral character. He's a hard worker. Mm -hmm. Let me, what, you know, lift him up. Because they have a whole group of family and friends who they love, who they consider have good moral character. And they're like, why would I ever lift him above him? Right? Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's just how systems work, right? That's just how systems work economically, politically, judicially. That's how they work, right? You, you, you yeah. believe in and help the people that you know first. Yep. Plain and simple, sense. right? Yep. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so um, now let's advance that to how Black people were treated in America, right? We were purposely put at the bottom of the system that was created, right? And we were used and we were thought of as less than, and originally we weren't even thought of as an entire man. We were more property, right? And every time uh, an event happened where we had civil war and black people were free, right? And you had amendments established to kind of make black people equal, right? But the system, was still controlled by the same people, right? The system was still controlled by the same people, politically, judicially, right? Economically, right? It did not 
And some of those people really did not want to see black people move up. Like, I don't even want to get to know you. And it was segregated so that you could not get to know the Jimmy in a black community to even say that he had good moral character or he was a hard worker, right? And, and your parents even thought of him as less than a man. So if you really saw him excel, you had atrocities, right? Especially after black people were free. You had Rosewood, Mississippi. You had Tulsa, Oklahoma. You had race riots where white men in sheets killed hundreds of black people, right? And burned down towns and everything else, right? And, and not, never went punished, right? And so what did that do for the black psyche of people in the South, right? One, it caused a great migration. People fucking fled. Right? <laughs> to the north to work in factories and forward and all that every kind of stuff and and then two though it created this fear of as i go up i will always be beat down and that became a psychological thing that became built in and so it was almost a fear of success built into the into the mindset in the system right and so that's that's a that's a whole nother thing with brainwashing and all this other kind of stuff but some of it was done on purpose, right? So, okay, so the system, system oppresses because it's family, friends, people who look like me, right? And you don't look like me I, and I can't take time. Then segregation ended. Now you get a chance to know black people, right? But you still have some people that don't like, right? And don't trust, right? Because it's just ended, right? And I still have my friends, my family and everybody else who looks like me, who I would, I, why would I lift you up who I don't know before I lift them up, right? And so that still happens, right? And you have, because you've been economically depressed or suppressed for so long, you don't have an economic foothold, mm. right? And so one of the things that can, can beat, right, some of the things with systemic racism is economics, right? Which is why you have people like a Jay-Z or a Lil Wayne or, um, but Jay-Z didn't come out and say this, but like a Lil Wayne, like a Morgan Freeman, you can have like some of those videos that people have posted with some of the most affluent black Americans saying racism is not a problem, right? Because once you reach a certain economic level, it really isn't, right? It just, it, it's just, you know, your, your, your fame and your, your economic standing has just pretty much wiped away the ability for somebody to really truly oppress you on the judicial um, um, level and on the uh, political level, right? Because your economic standard is just like politics. If you're a billionaire, like politics affect you, right? But like, not a lot, like not, not, not like you, you know what I mean? Like not to the point where like, and you can affect and your money can affect politics so well that it's yeah. like, it's, yeah, it's not going to, you know what I mean? It's 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 just not the it's not the same. Like policing laws are not going to be like a glory to you because you're not trying. You're not doing anything economically shady, or you don't have to do anything economically adventurous to to move up or to survive, right? Okay, so that's the that's the systemic side is is that right? It's just that people who control the system will suppress any new entry into that system, right? And that's just, and that's, and that's people dynamics. That's how people work, right? And then we can dig on, um, if you want to, we can dig on laws placed in place that disproportionately targeted um, black communities. Um, and, but most of it, most of it was economic depression. Hold on for one second. Can you turn that down out there, please? Can you turn that down? Thank you. Okay, all right, sorry about that. Um, um, You're saying sorry. you talk about laws, laws, most of it was economic suppression. That's a okay. joke. Yeah, so, so once we we're all quarantined, sheltering and placing stills, we have to contend with family, friends, other people in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And construction that's outside the window here. <laughs> Please should yell at them. So. Yeah, I, I, I trust me, I want to. I feel like you've given me. I'm trying to work. Now. <laughs> trying to change. I'm trying to make the world a better place. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, like, <laughs> it's like what was it? Was it Will Ferrell yelling, "Mom, the meatloaf"? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So. 
So, um, but yeah, but okay. So you had just the, just the general suppression, systemic suppression that people do on all races, right? Um, no matter. And then you had the targeted um, racism, which created a barrier for white people to get to know black people, which made that just, just regular systemic oppression worse, right? Um, and laws written in place to, to keep it, like I said, depressed, to keep us economically um, depressed. And then when those laws sort of kind of went away, right? Um, it became, um, the ability to funnel money out of those communities, right? So when, when segregation, when now you had to, um, goodness gracious, Jared, uh, my mind is, when now you had to integrate, right? Then you had other tactics to keep money out of these communities, right? Keep money out of the school system. Um, part of it was just pure capitalism. Like, why would I put money in this economically depressed area when I can put this money in this economically affluent area, right? Without the, without the, some, not all of it was sinister. It was just like, I just make more money if I built something here than I built something here, right? I just do, right? So I'm going to build here first. I'm going to make it nicer so more people go there and spend their money there and they have more money to spend, right? But again, that, that, becomes a system that creates further economic distance, right? Further distance between one group and the other. So now this group is economically distanced from the rest of America, right? They're, they're economically at a lower place, right? From just regular systemic stuff, right? They just, I don't know you, I don't like you, I know him, I like him, I'm gonna, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, to actual laws put in place to suppress from slavery to Jim Crow to segregation to to that and so and now just capitalism wise it just doesn't make sense to invest my money into that right and now it's this big this big gap so what do people resort to to fill in that gap crime right because it's the only way because no one's going to give me money a bank is not going to give me money right to build a business in this community because the bank is like that's a high risk low reward investment it's a high risk low reward investment so why would i give you money to a loan to start a business there right so no <laughs> no mm -hmm. right why would i even like even even the money to buy a house there as those neighborhoods got worse and worse and worse, right? It was no, right? And so anyway, so now you have people who are, they're in this economically depressed situation and they look to fill in the gap with drugs, right? Because, you know, everything else is, is the door feels closed, right? And that is the fastest way for me to economically fill the gap, right? And then you have, what we call, they call it black on black violence because black communities were more strategically in tighter knit groups, economically depressed than others, right? Um, and so when I say strategically, I mean um, from all of the other stuff we talked about, Jim Crow, yada, 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 to then the end of segregation and the start of redlining and the moving of money out of those communities into more affluent ones, right? And so, you know, people, and then if you really dig and then into projects and tenements, right? And so now you're like, we've redlined, we've sectioned it off. We don't really wanna invest money in these communities, right? but they're spread out. Hmm. So now how do we consolidate them so we can invest money in these other places? So we consolidate them by moving all the low income housing into the smallest space as possible. We build big, massive project buildings and we invest no money into that community because it's 
low value, high risk. And so it gets worse and drugs come in. And then you have a highly competitive atmosphere in a very small space. What happens, right? Highly competitive atmosphere, very small space, violence, violence. One of the reasons that violence has gone down in the black community, you had champions, you know, and oh, doesn't this, had champions like Rudy Giuliani, right? <laughs> who fought against, who fought against crime. And he took down much of the, you know, his started to take down much of the mafia and organized crime in New York and which trickled down to hurt other criminal organizations. But then you also had the tearing down of projects, right? And when you started to tear down projects, economic, like the money was able to disperse more equally because then the people were dispersed, right? And so people were able to, to live in areas where they were able to benefit from the money invested into those communities. So that a lot of, a lot of things about systemic racism have, have changed and are much better. Some of the laws put in place are still the same, right? And some of the, the, the cognitive biases of just systemic things of just, I know this person and identify with this person more than I identify with this person, right? Causes some of the disparity between sentencing and how, you know, black people are sentenced as far as crimes are concerned, right? And so, you know, you have the, the case of, you know, the one guy, two guys with the same criminal past, one white, one black, one getting two years um, imprisoned in probation, the other getting 27 years. Yeah. You have, multiple, you have multiple cases like that. And, you know, even that, that judge may not think of his stuff as racist, right? And, and whatever, it, but he has certain racial biases where he thinks that this kid is redeemable, right? And he thinks that this kid is, can change. And he thinks that this kid can't, right? And so, you know, Jimmy or either, whether they're both Jimmys or not, you know, they could both be thugs. They could both be, I doubt that, right? But I'm pretty sure they both have somebody that they love in their life, right? Yeah. Um, you know, um, but one is redeemable and we'll give a second chance and one we don't, right? Um, white felons are hired at something like, I think it's, it's like uh, um, 75% higher rate than black felons, right? And so the, sec the second chance that's given, it happens at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. And so those are the, the, the things that are left over from systemic racism. And then just the whole, uh, I think, okay, I better stop. But the whole, where Jamie posted um, the picture of the babies, the little dolls. Did you see that video? One of, one of the people in the group posted a, a video. And it's a video from like the 80s, 90s. Um, it's still relevant, but not quite as relevant. Um, but it's, it's uh, little kids. I think it might be from the early 90s. Little kids looking at two dolls, white doll and a black doll. And they ask them, which doll is the pretty doll? White doll. Which oh, doll I have doll? seen that before. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right? And, and that is when they put, brought those kids in there and somebody in the group commented, my, my child was not like that. And I immediately knew. I was like, well, your kid didn't grow up watching television and you raised them well, right? And so the, the problem is you can raise your kids really well, but if they watch TV, yep. right? The portrayal, even to this day, um, large part in the black community is, is criminality. It's changing. It's changing a lot, right? And that's why people, and he's, fucked it all up but that's why people were so in love with like the cosby show right um Dude, because it show showed it showed what we consider a normal black family mm. because that is that truth of the matter is for all the people watching this that is most most of black america most of black men and women are not criminals yeah most are not. Most are good, upstanding citizens, 
like unfortunate reference, like, but like the Cosby or like the Winslows, if you ever watched Family Matters, right? Where the dad was a cop and Urkel was the annoying neighbor, right? And he liked, you know, that's, that's most black families, mm-hmm. right? It really is, right? And you see more of that um, start to come out, but it, it really is, right? It's most black America, but there is a, a strong criminal element because of, like I said, there was this big economic dispersity in black communities. And then it was again, like in these really close knit communities, like, so it created um, war, right? And it created, you know, it created a fight over a small territory, right? Which, which perpetuated the violence, made it that much worse. Um, most, I'm gonna, shouldn't assume this, so maybe you can tell me. I feel like most poor white communities are dispersed. Right, it's not a lot of people crammed into a small, tiny space, whereas like most poor white communities are relatively rural, right? And so you might have one guy that deals drugs, but most don't, right? Mm-hmm. And and um, and as far as like you know, economic opportunity, it's not the cost of living isn't that much higher than you know what you could do for a regular job, right? Like so, like in a in in a city, right, which is where we talk about most black communities and crime on crime, right? The cost of living is is way up here, right? So you can't work. It's very hard to work a normal job, right? Yeah. And get and elevate yourself, right? Or or build enough economic stability that they'll let you buy a house in that city in that place where no bank wants to give a loan to. Is that, am I making any kind of sense? Yeah, yeah, Jared. So if I could just, you know, touch on that real quick. As I was listening to you, first of all, dude, thank you. Because that was probably one of the best explanations I've ever heard. And I mean, really, it was, you, you, I think you, <clears throat> you covered some points in a way that I haven't heard in taking out God knows how many history and different classes. And I think you just did it in such a succinct way. And as I was listening so I was listening for a few things. One, I was listening to understand and hear what you were saying, but I was also listening to try to differentiate. Where's the differentiator? Because I grew up in a you know, fairly poor, uh, you know, m- very whitewashed community. I mean, it was just like, I, I remember being 18 and moving to college and my, my college roommate was Chinese. And it was the first time I'd really like had a, you know, like a non-white person interaction, like actually with that now we're in, in an intimate space. And and it was kind of whoa this is so you know different it, it was just it was never it was never different in the sense of it was just it was a different thing and i never thought of that before because you know it's just what i knew it was what i was familiar with but i had grown up with bruce lee being my hero and everything else and so i you know luckily like my media had been curated in a way that i had exposure in that way but never actually in person so i'm listening and thinking well i grew up in this really kind of poor white area i you know money was always a struggle Uh, we had our share of of drug problems where i grew up it was largely timber industry and then when the timber industry started to get shut down because of environmental regulations when i was a kid a lot of people turned to start growing marijuana and there's even a documentary on netflix called murder mountain that came out last year i think and it's it's an area just down the street where basically it's it's a bunch of good it was good old boys dispensing good old boy justice with fellow uh, marijuana growers and people would come up there to what they call I think clipping where they come up there trim marijuana and they disappear you know a lot of people who are kind of loners or vagabonds and they move around to these different places and they just disappear and the documentary alleges that that's one of the highest missing person places a rate of missing persons in I think the U.S. or maybe even uh, I don't want to quote too much of that because I'm probably misquoting it but the thing that really just stood out for me with you there was this because then I'm listening to so I want to try to understand how is it different that where's where's the difference of acknowledging what's happened in the past but where we are now because I I I believe we can learn so much from the past and I also believe we have to take responsibility for our right now and our future right so where's the separation for me as a kid growing up in this poor white area you know and, and, and we're not talking about big dreams or anything like that at all we're talking about you know, my, my education is paying the bills. 
you know, making sure you pay bills, go to school so you can, you know, my, my, my mom very much was go to school so you can be better off than your dad and I are. And that was something she, she always told me education was going to be that way. That was what she believed. The thing that I really stood out to me, what you said is it was rural. It was where I grew up. I was, while that was going on, I also grew up in a very like wooded area. So I didn't have a neighborhood. I was on this, we rented this, this small home from people. So we had access to like 40 acres of trees, essentially. And it was just, I never had really friends in the sense of a neighborhood community growing up. I would have people I interacted with school. But when I would come home, it would just be really me and my, bro my brother and I. And, you know, imagination or the one television channel you got, which I, I had the one channel. So I grew up watching the Cosby show. I grew up watching Fresh Prince. I grew up watching those shows. I never did see Urkel. I just knew of Urkel because he was kind of a pop <laughs> culture thing, but he's on a different station. But it was, it was rule. And so now in thinking of that, I didn't have it where I'm combined in with other people going through the same stuff as I was. So even going to school, that's six or seven hours a day. And then you step back and there's a separation from it. Even our neighborhoods, you know, going back, when I go back to visit my mom, neighborhoods are, are spaced out where each, each neighborhood has a little bit of green in it. It has a little yard. You know, the houses have some distance between each other. You're not necessarily, most apartment buildings are, you know, three stories of that high. They have a little community space, all these things. And, and so what I'm taking from that is, is there is a place to have a little bit of escape or there is a place to have a contrast, right? Where you can see something different than what's shoved right in front of you. But what I'm hearing from you and with the, with the black community, which I never considered this before, is when you are, everything is so stacked in and so condensed and you have this massive amount of people kind of shoved into one small geographic area and everybody is struggling for the same thing. And it finds out very quickly that, hey, cousin Jimmy, or now this might not even be cousin Jimmy, this might be friend Jimmy, mm -hmm. was able to make some money to buy a ticket to go see a movie by selling this. And hey, if you want to go see the newest Avengers movie that's coming out, just go over here and this guy will give you some of the stuff. And all you have to do is just take some of that stuff and, and go and take it over there. And I imagine like with most, and I want to get into the crime piece with you, and I know we're, we're going to be coming tight on time, so this is going to definitely be a two-part piece. Most of the criminal stuff, so it's, it's very easy, I think, when you're a, a law-abiding citizen to cast a judgment of, well, just don't commit crime, right? It's, it's just don't commit crime. And I've, I've said that too, like, and I've said it pretty, you know, not exclusively to one group or another. It's just, hey, like, don't fucking commit crime be a better person but i realize there's in my ignorance in the sense of the the 10 year old kid or the eight year old kid who goes to run some dope for whatever it is and goes and sees cousin jimmy who's operating on the corner they're not doing it to try to break a law they're probably doing it because they want to be able to have access to the latest you know, Mario Brothers game, just like everybody else, or go see the newest Avenger movie or go something like that. And the point being is it's these very innocent intentions that a lot of these things will start to start that develop what we might call criminal behavior on a more massive scale than the road. And where I'm hearing though, and which I thousand percent agree with you on this, where there's a huge problem with that is, is when we are prosecuting people, we're not prosecuting from that innocent intent that it originated with. And in that first origin space with that innocent intent, there's no way you can get away from it because that's just what all your kid, everybody else is doing. Whereas where I grew up, where I might be poor and I might have economic depravity, we could go play outside, we could go play in the park, we could go you know, swing on a swing set because that was all literally just right outside. So there's other options for me. I didn't have to go and see the newest Avenger movie because there was other options. And when I, I remember Netflix has this, this thing, and I've seen numerous studies done it before where they were evaluating 
and they were giving these hypothetical scenarios of, and so the black, I think it was a black man and a white guy, same crime. They go through juries, hypothetical juries. The, the white guy gets eight years, the black guy gets 24. And I've seen studies like that across the board on how, and, and that's where I'm really hearing from you right now, and, and please correct me if I'm, I'm missing this, but what I'm really hearing is that for growing up as a poor white kid, there were options. Growing up as a poor black kid, it's so shoved right in your face. And the innocent intent of going and getting, you know, running dope or whatever it is, to be able to go and see the movie, be a part of some sort of community, do something fun. It's almost what you learn. And so then when it ends up in the judicial system, there's not a fair shake because you're not getting prosecuted from the innocent intent. You're getting prosecuted as just being a criminal. Part of what you said was 100% on point. Um, the, the distance, the compact, what the compactness does is it, 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 it makes the crime more socially acceptable within the community. Um, it just makes it, like you said, it's in your face. It makes it more of a reality. Um, as far as the whys, um, the having nice things um, is, is a, or doing things is, is definitely a part of it. So it's more acceptable. And if I want nice things, this is the way to, to have them. Um, for sure. Um, and that's where my, I guess, perspective gets a little bit different. Um, because I knew kids that hustled to feed their families. Mm. You know what I mean? I knew yeah. kids that hustled to feed their families. Like I said, my mom's a heroin addict, right? I have friends who both parents were heroin addicts. Right or one one parent was a heroin addict, the other one was locked up or dead, right? And they didn't have that the choice, right? Um, it really wasn't it wasn't much of a choice, right? It was like yeah. if I if if you know my mom won't even take the time to take me to the Salvation Army to get clothes. You you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And they yeah. didn't have and and nobody but the person on the corner cousin Jimmy, friend Jimmy, whatever, had their back, right? And whoever cousin, cousin Jimmy taught what he knew. Cousin Jimmy said, well, you want this, this is how you get it. Cause this is how I know to get it, right? And so here's this, here's this option, take this path. And, and, and what happens is then you have competition that creates, that arises and makes that, takes it to the next level. Just like you said, Murder Mountain, uh, uh, they, people lost their job so they started growing marijuana people start to take their marijuana and take their life and they're questioning their livelihood so you have a bunch of disappearances yep. right but imagine you know instead of 10 marijuana growers you have a thousand you, know, you, you get what I'm saying yeah man and also yeah. what I'm hearing too is is in my upbringing, why I may have grown up in some sort of economic disparaging circumstances, I'm not even having to consider I have to hustle to pay, put food on the table for my family. I get to play in that safe space of, I got to hustle if I want to go and see the new Avengers movie. And I think that's a big difference that I've never really considered before with that is it's it's a convenience for me to draw parallels of what are kids going after you know fun excitement entertainment whatever that is and it's a reality that i was able to escape even growing up poor even though we would talk about you know not having money to put food on the table or anything like that it was never a reality of you're gonna have to confront to go do this to get food and nor was it never a reality, I think, in its terms of on a mass scale where you might have a thousand. Everybody's doing that. And that becomes a, an accepted thing where 
you know, we were talking about this beforehand and I know we're going to run out of time here, but the origins of love, you know, in most of our actions that we take. And I so appreciate you saying that because dude, I, I, I never even had to consider that. You know, I never had to consider that my experience of being poor was, was one of, of not having money was causing my mom happiness you know, not having money was shame because we couldn't pay bills on time or something like that. It was never a matter of, we don't have money, so I need to go out and do something, you know, wrong, whatever that is, to get food. But in the dynamic reverse, in poor black communities, it's, hey, if you want to eat, if you want to take care of your family, you need to find cousin Jimmy because he's going to have your back and he's going to help provide you the means to do that. Yes. Hmm. Yes. 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 So that's a whole nother, it's a whole nother thing. Right. And so, yeah. And, um, and I mean, that's, that's real. It's like I said, is that a reality for everybody that gets involved in that business? No, but it's enough. It's enough of, of, of the most, especially the most reckless of what you would consider soldiers who do that, right? It's enough. And, 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 and when you have those people who are just really fighting for survival, right? It just, it takes the, the entire game to a whole, whole nother level, right? Um, it takes it to a whole nother level. And so, but, you know, it, we, I, like I, like you said, I think we, sh- we sh- I gotta I gotta wrap it up. I gotta get off of here. Um, but um, we'll do yeah. So so next show. time I do want to address like some people do 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 stuff like that to to have nice clothes and nice Jordans most of the time, or what or what kind of I guess what that community makes acceptable and what it doesn't, right? And um, you know, systemic racism is all of the systemic things that happened to create that kind of economic gap, right? That created what people felt was the necessity for that or the pain that um, permeated a community that allowed drugs to invade it in the way that Mm. it did, right? And permeate that community because because most people who use who start off using drugs and get addicted, they're filling an empty void. They're coming from a hurt and painful place and they're trying to escape that pain. So if you have a whole community that's in pain and you give them this out, right? This psychological out, you give them that, there a lot of a lot of them are going to take it and become addicted to it. And so um, you know, that is so when we talk about like <laughs> It's, 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 it's a lot of this information is commonplace knowledge. I think that's another issue. And we'll talk about this too in the black community is that a lot of this information is commonplace knowledge. Like, so I told you the vast majority of black families are Cosby's, uh, you know, everybody else, right? And you have a small sect, not a small sect, but you have a percentage set of criminals, right? Highly violent criminals, right? But that information that we're talking about now is is responsible parents teach it to their children when they're ready to hear it if that makes any kind of sense right um i i explained it to someone else um like a jewish family will never let their children forget the holocaust whether you taught it in history books or not they just won't right so the truth of the matter is like black families who who like like even though my mom's a heroin addict she has three master's degrees right and my dad is a my dad's a lawyer right learning our history in the united states of america was always important so you know as you've seen the the african-american communities median income go up and you see black people who did not fall into crime and criminality and then a lot of them that have right None of this, like this information, like the Tulsa, the riots, Rosewood, all these things are coming out. We, we've not, we've always kept ourselves educated on it. 
um, because it's, it's, it's a part of our history. And, and, and uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, there are a few, but not many. But we don't, it's not, it's not held on to say, I'm angry at <laughs> white people. It's not held on to say, um, I got to get vengeance. It's just, he- it's just held on to, to understand our own people and our own problems. So, cause it's, it's, I will give, and we're going to end this here. I will give everybody in the white community this. It is hard to watch television. It is hard to see crime rates in cities, right? And things like that. And to understand the level of violence or disregard for human life and the nature of that criminality. So when we teach our children about our history, it's so that we can understand the psychology of ourselves first and foremost, so that we can look in the mirror and see our own humanity and not become a Candace Owens who has, who has demonized all of black culture. Right? And, and it's because she doesn't understand the maturation of the psychology or how the system worked to create that. So when my father was teaching me that stuff, he wasn't teaching me to say, or well, my grandparents hate white people. He was teaching me to say, understand the pain that your brothers and sisters are going through and love them. Mm. And so that is why we hold on to it, right? For the most part, for the most part, so that we can, we can not, we can look in the mirror and learn to love ourselves. Because that was, if you want to talk about what was really stripped from African-Americans, that. Mm. The ability to look in the mirror and feel pride in what you see. That's what happened when, when, when and we'll leave it here, but that's what happened when you know whole identities were stripped away and culture and everything else and now your culture is gangsterism so to speak in a lot of fucking ways how do i fucking look in the mirror and love myself when that is the way i'm represented in everything and so i understand that's why i want to do this talk because i can understand how you know someone from a different culture a different race could just be so distant because because you see the same things I see. The same things that would make me look in the mirror and possibly hate myself, you see that. So I have to understand it. I have to understand what brought my culture there. Just like if you were a fucking, just to be honest, just keep it, and we're ending right here. If you were a goddamn Viking, right? And the motherfucker, and and, in the 14, 1500s, and you looked out and all your people did was rape, pillage, and kill, (laughs) <laughs> right and you and you had a and you had an elevated like way of thinking you'd be like oh my god we're just murderers and killers yeah. And yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? but it was more socially acceptable so it was okay right but yeah. But, yeah. but they were they were monsters to all of europe because <laughs> they just got on a ship landed on your shore wiped out everybody raped all the women took all the goods and left right and, and, and so, um, you know, people can elevate that and whatever now, but like, I, I, it's probably the worst analogy, but, <laughs> but, I knew you're going to I told but, you. uh, but yeah, but like, it's, it's very hard. It's very hard to, to look at some of the atrocities committed in our own community. And, 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 um, even if you lived it and you touched it, and it was close to you, like I did to understand it, um, and to have compassion for the, for the people who commit those things. So we have to understand our history. Um, in order to 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 see how it got there, right? And and I think that's what's going on now is that you know white America is, is is finally coming to a point where they can understand they can see all these, you know, inhuman behavior is create is done by human beings all the fucking time, and there's and there is a psychological reason basis and the maturation to that process, right? That that is that goes beyond race or color or anything. So anyway, that's. That's it. I know we didn't end on a cliffhanger, did we? No, that was good, man. That's complete. So just to quickly wrap it up, everyone, I hope you 
we'd love to hear your thoughts, your opinions, your discussions on this. This isn't about who's right, wrong, good, bad, anything like that. This is really about having really open and honest conversation, being able to ask the tough questions, look yourself in the mirror. So please, please share your thoughts. We'd love for you to be a part of the Facebook community so we can go more depth in this. It's uh, building a bridge 2020 facebook.com building bridge 2020.com hop over there and we'll put links in there for it as well. And yeah, well, we'd love to hear what you th your thoughts are on this as well. And also, you know, one other question, I'll put a poll up in our Facebook group with this too. Uh, what about frequencies? Do you, are you finding value in these once a week? Would you like these to be maybe twice a week? You know, we really want to hear from you to make sure we're, we're creating a community that we can all come together and, and have these conversations, hold this space, have these discussions. And it's only, we're only going to grow if we come together. So that's really what we help to facilitate. And Jared, man, I really appreciate you sharing and opening up and going to these different places and, and explaining things from the way you, in, in, from the perspective you did, but in the way you did, it, it made it feel very safe for me to share my opinion, my observations. And it made me feel very uh, safe to be able to contribute to a discussion that I have felt uncertain about contributing to. And I, and I just thank you for today. This was really, this was really powerful. Oh, Hey, I, I appreciate it. I hope I didn't lose people at the end there. Um, and don't be, don't be afraid to ask the hard questions. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I, I, I hope, I hope that that last, uh, I guess diatribe gave people permission to say, oh, so, so black people in general do have their own negative feelings about, you know, what are considered the behaviors of, of, of the black community or um, culture in general, right? And it, reiterate this, the majority of black people are like the fucking Cosby's and, <laughs> and the family of yeah. Fresh Fruits of Bel Air. <laughs> I think the majority of white people are too. Like that's yes, something. no, exactly. Yes. Well, that's accepted, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. I think that's, that's, that is, yeah. that is accepted in general knowledge. Like we know that we know that. Um, I don't think it's accepted in general knowledge that the majority of, 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 of black people are not standing on the corner selling drugs. Yeah, I agree. I think that's yeah. really, yeah. So anyway, that's, I mean, that's, okay. All right, All right. All right everybody, we'll stop. We, we know we told you we keep these shorter. So we're, we're getting there. We're working on Be patient with us. We'll see you all next time. Make it Bye. easy. Thanks, Jesse. You bet, Jared.